Wonderful. Okay. Well, welcome. I just wanted to kick things off today to thank you all for carving out time. I know that it's unprecedented times and that we are extremely busy dealing with our own lives and our own businesses. Uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. We had close to 100 people register and as an event planner, we were a little bit late getting the invite out with uh, sending that out, I think on Tuesday. So uh, 100 people in two days, you know, there is hope for these digital events and people will register and come. <laughs> Um, first and foremost, I hope that everyone on the line, you and your families are staying healthy and safe during this time. And again, thanks for joining us. So before we jump into things, and this is a very robust topic and we could talk about it for at, for at length and certainly fill more than one hour. So I'm going to just lay out the, uh, the ground rules or the rules of engagement, so to speak. So first of all, I just want to let everyone know we are recording this session, both audio and, and video, um, but there's more of a focus on the presentation that you should be able to see on your screen, not on individual people's faces. Um, but I do encourage everyone to go on video. It really helps with these digital platforms and making the experience more uh, dynamic and engaging. So if you're comfortable with that, please do um, you know, give us a smile and go on camera. As you know, when you registered, we asked you to pose a question about the, the digital space, events, um, really anything that has to do with this topic. So thank you all for participating already. We received uh, at least one, if not more, from every person who registered. And we have planned the flow and structure of our conversation today with all of those questions in mind. And to make this even more interactive and engaging, what I thought we could do is when we get to the point in the conversation when we're going to address your question, I'm going to see if the person um, whose question we've pre-selected uh, is on the line. And if you're comfortable, if you just want to take yourself off mute and pose the question, and then I can direct it to the speaker who I think um, might have the, the best answer. And that way you're getting involved, you're interacting with the speakers, and I thought that it would add a level of dynamicism to the conversation. If you're not comfortable, no worries. I'll ask the question on your behalf. Um, so that's basically um, all I wanted to say about the rules of engagement. And uh, actually one, one point, there's a chat feature. If you haven't found that already, you can use that chat feature um, on the bottom of your screen to ask me a direct question uh, that you might want me to ask one of the speakers or if there's something that you didn't ask in advance or, or really anything. Um, you can just use uh, the chat box. If you want to network and talk with each other and introduce yourself so that everyone knows who's on the line, you can go ahead and do that in the chat box. You have the ability to broadcast a message to everyone who's participating. You can also choose from the drop down menu to speak to one on one with someone you may know or with myself or with my colleague who is under the Redstone Agency handle. Without further ado, I will quickly introduce myself. For those of you who don't know, I'm Carly Silberstein. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Redstone Agency. Um, many of you on the line are client of our, clients of ours, so you know what we do, but we're a full service event and association management company. This is our second digital round table, and it's going to wind up being a series. Our intention with these content pieces was to bring like-minded people together clients or otherwise uh, during this really uncertain time because we're all just trying to navigate you know every day minute by minute the changing environment and we just wanted to bring like-minded people together to exchange ideas and talk about relevant and valuable information um, about our industry and about associations and things like that so that is enough from me for the time being. I'd now like to introduce you to the speakers. So we are joined here with an esteemed um, panel of speakers. We have joining us from New Zealand, so this really is a global conversation. Mm -hmm. um, from New Zealand, we have Jennifer King and Cush. She is the founder and strategist of King and Cush Solutions. Uh, she was formerly at the DEI, which is, uh, she'll get into it, but it is a PCMA entity. Uh, we also have Bianca Kennedy, who is president-elect uh, for the Canadian Association of Exposition Management and is a show manager um, in her day job. And then we have Raul Gould, who is the founder and CEO of Feedloop, a Toronto-based event technology company. And now I will really pass it over uh, to the speakers to give a more fulsome introduction to who they are and what their connection to digital events is. So Jennifer, I'm going to pass it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Carly. Can everyone hear, can you hear me okay? Is sure can. Volume? Okay. okay, perfect. 
Thank you for having me here today, and I'm really excited to have this conversation with the other panelists, Carly, and everyone here. I am passionate about digital event space. Um, I really got into it after the recession, which happened in 2008 um, in our industry, when uh, when people were concerned about face-to-face -face and digital events started getting <clears throat> on the rise with the different technology, and the industry got really nervous in 2009. Um, and so at the time I was with PCMA um, and that was when our leadership said, you know what, we need to explore this space um, and we're going to experiment and if the, the industry can learn from us, if what we fail and what we succeed. So I had the feeling that I think a lot of people on this call might have like, oh my God, how do I make this work? Um, and we started experimenting. So in 2010, we did our beta test and then grew and experimented over years, producing community leaders um, and many different events. Um, for PCMA, did consulting for other organizations. Um, then was also the leadership for the Digital Experience Institute, which um, is, is an entity within PCMA focused on this space, um, doing education, resources. Um, we created an ROI report, which we'll talk um, a little bit about in a, a ROI, um, our return on engagement, ROE. Um, and uh, also had a certification. So that's how I had the pleasure of meeting Carly. She's one of the digital event strategists, um, which we have global, um, but it was committed to the education in the space. So she was a, a forward thinking um, visionary and getting into that space early. So I'm really excited to be part of the panel today and um, have this conversation together. Thank you so much for being with us. Now I would like to pass it over to Bianca. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as Carly mentioned, uh, my day job is uh, as show manager of the Quebec City and Montreal Motorcycle Shows. And uh, as part of that, um, and, and part of my, you know, responsibility and, and involvement in the event industry led me to join CAEM, which as Carly said, is the Canadian Association of Exposition Management, um, probably about 12 years ago, and uh, immediately started volunteering with the association, joined the board of directors. And as Carly mentioned, um, I'm currently vice president of that association. We are about a um, 300 or so member association. Our members are um, companies that are involved in the production of trade and consumer shows, as well as all the suppliers of products and services to the exposition industry. And, um, you know, Ky Carly invited me here today, I think, um, as an example of an association that has taken um, some small but I think important steps towards embracing some digital strategies into some of our events last year. Uh, we did do a couple of, you know, interesting things that allowed us to step into that realm, you know, as Jennifer said, experiment a little, um, and they went really well. You know what? Um, really glad that we did that. And in many ways, um, you know, making those, taking those steps and, you know, taking some risks, trying some new things, trying some new approaches has become, you know, part of our strategy, I think, moving forward in terms of how we look at, you know, live events and hybrid events and things like that. So, you know, we're an example at CAEM of an association that really by no means is an expert in any way whatsoever on digital events. Um, like most people probably on the, the line today, you know, we rely and most of what we do is face to face. I mean, that's what CAEM is all about. But we did have um, some good successes and looking forward to sharing some of the steps we took and, you know, some of the um, strategies we put in place to turn those, you know, experiences and, and that leap into successes for our members and uh, our association. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bianca. And Raul, <laughs> let's pass it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carly. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, you know, being sort of on the front lines right now uh, on this topic and uh, when it comes to event technology is uh, initially it was a little scary uh, because, you know, we, the first domino that kind of pulled out for us uh, and that was sort of the big event in Canada was the Shopify Unite event. And then that really sent a pretty strong signal to us a couple of weeks ago that like something big uh, might be happening here. Um, so, you know, being an event technology company, uh, we had the resources to try and respond immediately. So we pivoted very quickly um, to see what we could do to help events uh, that would look to go online and go virtual. And I think that was something that was hard for 
a lot of events to sort of grapple with and understand, even for us, you know, how do we take this amazing on-site experience uh, and make it virtual? And by no means have we, uh, you know, necessarily cracked the equation fully, but, you know, I think we're getting closer as an industry. And what's really exciting about this opportunity, I think for the industry is, you know, we're, we have, we have no choice. We, you know, we're, we're looking to take events online and it might be paving the way for a really exciting future uh, for us all. And just being a part of that um, is very interesting. So our mission really became over the last few weeks to you know, keep the show going on. Um, and right now we feel a strong sense of responsibility to sort of just fill the gap. Um, one of the things that's very exciting uh, for me is I, I come from a tech background myself. I spend a lot of my time coding as well. So it's very interesting to be able to meet with event planners uh, and listen to what the, their expectations are from a virtual events sort of platform and see what we can do to sort of meet those expectations or find other pieces of technology that we can suggest to them that might help them sort of bridge that gap. Uh, for us really right now, it's about making that transition, but there are elements of this whole situation that we think are going to, you know, change events for decades to come. Uh, and we're excited to be a part of that process. Uh, I'm excited to be here to hopefully um, shed some light on it um, and, uh, and looking forward to what everyone has to say on this panel. Um, so thanks, Carly. Looking forward to, uh, to the rest of the session. Thank you all so much for being here with us. So we're going to jump right into it. So Jennifer, this one's for you. Technology is evolving at the speed of light and can be overwhelming in normal circumstances. But now couple that with COVID-19, global pandemic and everything that's going on, no doubt people are not only intimidated, but anxious by all the options that are out there from you know, internal communication tools, considering everyone's working from home, um, now needing to take their events online, meetings via video conference, you know, there's just so much out there. I'm thinking to set the tone and the context for this conversation. Let's start at the basics. Let's assume that, that people um, on, the, on this call um, aren't very familiar with digital events and, and when we use that word. So maybe you can shed some light on, you know, what are digital events? It's a very it's a term that's very loosely used. Um, hybrid events, we heard that term already be thrown out there. And maybe what are some of the similarities and differences between those? Um, and then within those, are there, are there different types of events that could be categorized as digital and or hybrid? So, um, you know, a lot to unpack there, but let's hand it over to you to, you know, set the tone for the conversation. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Carly. Great question. So a digital event is the umbrella of the space. So anything that has a digital component we, we categorize as a digital event. And then within that, um, like Carly said, there's different categories. So a hybrid event is the one that would be closest to the face-to-face -face audience. A hybrid event means there's a physical um, event that you then live stream and have a remote audience extended with you. So with PCMA, for Community Leaders and Education Conference, we had a hybrid event. So there'd be the PCMA annual meeting, and then we would have several thousand people online with us that would engage with the speakers and everything happening at the event. We also did this, we did um, the Canadian Innovation Conference helped do that um, with a hybrid several years ago. So those would be some examples of a hybrid event. Um, a virtual event, or can also be called a digital event, could be no face-to-face -face, um, no face -face component, component. So like today, this would be um, a digital event. Um, it's a webinar digital event, one session. Um, another example would be the Digital Experience Institute. We used to do a summit, which was completely online. Um, there's other education with um, that I've seen examples in associations where all the education is online, speakers are online, everything's digital. A rebroadcast is, <clears throat> is when you have a session. So for example, today's session, if Carly decided she wanted to rerun it, um, but it was the, the recording from today, but at one time, like a simulive, that would be a rebroadcast. So you would still have a live, a live element. It would be like back in the day TV before you had Netflix and everything where everything was on time, but it was, it was recorded already. And that's a really good, uh, a good way to extend your content. That's a really low risk way to record everything ahead of time. You can still have the speakers or presenters um, answer questions. And then um, the last one worth wild to mention, and there's lots of different configurations of things, but is a satellite or a hub. So a satellite or a hub is where you have a physical, many different little physical locations brought together with a digital component. So an example of this would be the, the Internet Society. Um, they did a Chasing the Sun um, around, and they had different groups meeting in Africa, in Europe, in the States, South America, 
and then they were brought together, those groups were brought together. So um, those would be some different examples of kind of the breakdown on what a digital event and the different formats are. Perfect, thank you so much. So Bianca, I'm gonna throw a question over to you now. So now we have COVID-19, that's the reality. And I think the world over is realizing that there's essentially no choice but to adapt and to consider integrating elements of digital into their strategies. However, you mentioned that your association introduced digital components just last year, which was before the need ar arose with COVID-19 or, or any other circumstance such as that. So can you tell us and walk us through the, the scenario um, as to why the association went in this direction? What was the catalyst? And you know, in that decision-making process, what value did you believe at the board level would be brought to your events, to your stakeholders, to the membership? Um, maybe walk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so as you mentioned, um, you know, need, I think that's a big thing. Um, the first um, step that we took towards integrating a digital component into one of our events did come from a need. Um, definitely not as, you know, drastic or, or dire as the need that we're in now, but still nonetheless a need. And, you know, let me explain what I mean by that is, um, you know, we were putting together our annual conference and as we traditionally always have um, an industry panel of experts that, you know, we do in a very traditional way, like many conferences do, where you have all your panelists on stage, your moderator on stage and your audience in the room. So everyone together face to face in the same room under one roof. Um, and as we were putting this panel together and, you know, looking to who the right moderator could be, uh, the person we chose, who happens to be Carly herself from Redstone, because Redstone is our um, association management company at CAM, um, you know, mentioned that, you know, she'd love to be able to do this. And, um, you know, everyone on the committee and the panelists absolutely agreed she was the right person, but that her circumstances prevented her from being at conference in person that year. And so, you know, when we went back and, and looked at, you know, what we were facing, this, this challenge, this problem, but knowing that Carly was absolutely the right moderator for this session and the person that we wanted to do this, we had to get creative. We had to ask ourselves, you know, how can we overcome the limitation of location and make this happen? Um, and so we did. I mean, I think Carly had some experience already using this exact platform, Zoom, which is what we used for um, this session and to bring Carly in as a moderator digitally. Um, you know, we worked with our AV company, um, of course, which we had on board for, for our conference to help us with the equipment and the technology and the expertise that we needed in order to do this um, in a way that was going to, you know, be successful. And uh, it worked out really, really well. I mean, you know, it came from a need, but what was really interesting is that it really actually above and beyond the need that it presented created a very different dynamic for that session. Um, it was great to have Carly on the screen. You know, the feedback was that it really did feel like she was there and, and part of the conversation, even though she wasn't there physically. And um, it ended up being one of our highest rated sessions of the conference that year. So, you know, taking a risk and ended up really paying off and um, the value was you know really being able to um, go forward with what it was that we had planned and not have to you know make different choices and, and sacrifice what it is that we wanted to achieve um, and at the same time end up delivering you know a different and, and engaging and interesting experience as a result so that was the first um, experience we had with it which came out of a need the next was more of a desire, I would say, perhaps, um, and that was, you know, probably seeing the success that we had and feeling a little bit more confident having gone through that great experience. We, as an association, were planning our next event, which was Power Education Day, and that was a brand new event for CAEM. Um, and, you know, our association is a national association. This was a one-day event. Um, so we recognized that, you know, people from other parts of the country weren't going to be able to travel into Toronto for a one-day event. And so, uh, you know, a super passionate, driven, really forward-thinking committee um, on Power Education Day. I think a couple of them are on this session today. Um, but really, you know, wanted to absolutely bring this event to our members from coast to coast. And so, again, out of a desire to want 
to add value, to expand our reach, um, to really bring in our, our entire membership into this session, they decided they wanted to live stream it. So again, as Jennifer mentioned, it was really more of a, a hybrid event where we had the in-person mm -hmm. component, we had the live streaming going on, and we also had the rebroadcasting. So we actually filmed the entire session and then we did provide that afterwards. So we really tested out a couple of different things. Um, and again, the value was, like I said, you know, being able to add value for our members, being able to deliver a session to people who weren't able to attend in person. And again, you know, really well received by the people who did participate remotely. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for explaining how the digital event came to be and, um, and your experience, your positive experience with it. I think many people on the line are from associations that, again, are maybe a little bit apprehensive. So I think uh, having your success story as an example is really going to help some people move forward in a confident manner following this session. So Raul, now over to you, which you bring a different perspective coming from the tech side of things. Uh, a number of questions. Um, hosed in advance of this session, um, probably about half was related to platforms, specific technologies, features, functionality, and all and all of that. So there was a lot to unpack there, and I don't uh, expect you to go through absolutely everything. But I want to get your thoughts on: Is there one size that fits all in terms of tech? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the answer is definitely not. I mean, our team has been busier than we ever have in history. But it's not necessarily because every single event uh, needs a solution that, uh, you know, any company is saying, we have a virtual event solution, now you can migrate to virtual events and it's going to be the exact same experience. A lot of people are coming to us, a lot of organizations, they have a 50-person event and they feel compelled to find a virtual event solution and solve that. Whereas we always say, just use something like Zoom. It's it's honestly such a great tool uh, and it's going to get you really far and that's all you need. It's really cheap. It'll, it'll do the job. Um, and there's definitely not a one size fits all because on the other hand, we have an event, you know, we have events that are like 6,000 people. They have hundreds of booths and they're in this dilemma where obviously a zoom like situation, you know, solutions not going to work for their situation. So what do they do in that case? Uh, and I think, for that reason, you know, there's a spectrum that we kind of have to uh, understand where on one end, you know, there's like Zoom and there's Hangouts and, you know, live stream, YouTube live, they're going to fit just fine. They're going to work really well. They're like one or two hour sessions, 50, 100, maybe 200 attendees, something like that. Um, and then on the other end, you have all this, you know, exciting stuff that we're really far from right now, virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, Oculus Rift you know, uh, Magic Leap, we have this amazing headset that we play around with for fun. And now it's seeming, you know, so relevant uh, when uh, you, you have this whole augmented experience in front of you, but we're so far from the technology and it's obviously going to be very expensive. So what we're really seeing, Carly, is that there are events that are definitely going to fit into, hey, use a simple tool like Zoom and get the job done and it's going to work well and look forward to hosting those on-site events again in the future and they'll definitely be back. And then there's others that you know, they know that Zoom and all can kind of get them sort of the way there, but they don't want to reduce this amazing event that they've spent so much time and energy uh, and, and their whole, you know, year and, and beyond into and reduce it to a webinar. Um, and that's really where we're hoping a lot of tech can step up and start adapting solutions to fit those events that are sort of in the middle there, where they're, they're not just a small event, but, they're, but they're, they have elements to their event that matter a lot more than just the content, the networking, the trade show, all of that. But surprisingly, the most asked for feature that we've seen, and this wasn't even on our radar until you know a couple of weeks ago either, was the trade show component. Because a lot of people can think of some way to solve you know, the, the session conference par portion of their event by implementing a, a solution like Zoom, one way or another, they'll get it to work. But what do we do with all our sponsors? What do we do with all our exhibitors? What's going to happen to all our networking? Uh, and that's the, that's the big thing. The, the only thing I'll, the, the last thing I'll say here is that, you know, having the privilege of working with event planners for so long, I've realized that you know, event, event planners, they don't want to settle. Perfection is super, super important to them. And I think that's something that uh, a lot of people that I talk to personally are sort of grappling with as well, because they want the event to be exactly like they had imagined it to be. And it's going to be tough to get it to that point. Going virtual is going to open up a lot of other opportunities and the live events will be back. Um, but I think there's an element that event planners and events will just have to um, accept. And even the attendees that 
there's going to be an element of um, setting expectations <clears throat> where you know, it's not going to be exactly perfect. There might be some glitches. These are large events that are going to try to go virtual. We're all going to get through it together, and we're going to hope that this is going to result in a much more robust and multidimensional events industry in the future. Um, we'll definitely talk a lot about some of the other solutions, uh, I'm sure, later in this uh, in this session. Thanks, Raul. I actually want to, you know, this is uh, off script, but I do want to dive a little bit deeper into something you mentioned. I know that there are a lot of uh, CAEM members and show managers on the line, and they've been, their questions were really centered around how do you take a, you know, a few hundred booth trade show and bring that online. So for some of those who are only familiar with Zoom and haven't really delved deep into what is possible in the realm of virtual events, can you maybe speak a little bit about, and it could be with your platform or just in general in the tech space, some of the other options out there, like, you know, um, is it an avatar on a screen that you're actually with your mouse going booth to booth or just maybe describe a little bit about the functionality that does exist? Because I think that, um, you know, making people feel that there is hope and that there are solutions out there that could try to replicate to some degree of their show floors. I think that would um, make people feel a lot better. For sure. And I'm going to say, I wish I had, I could say like, Hey, this one platform has got it so right. Like yeah. you can take your trade show virtual. It'll work perfectly. Mm -hmm. Um, the answer is no, not yet, but I, I'm, I think like us, I think there are probably a lot of companies that are racing to solve this problem. I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, how it's working on our end and some of what I've seen as well. And maybe there can be a, a happy medium somewhere for us. The main thing about the show floor is being able to network with exhibitors, them being able to capture leads, all of that, you know, sort of stuff. And it, we don't want to reduce it to, hey, look at somebody's profile page and send them an email. So what we've implemented is like real time chat, real time video, real time audio, the ability to share files in real time, still navigate kind of a 2D map. And the direction that we're heading in is to build sort of that video game like experience. I was mentioning this, I, I, I come from a background also in video game design, and that just gets me so excited. And I think we're going to see more and more platforms that'll be able to do that. On the other end, there's some platforms that you might find where you can, you know, post a basic profile and you have the ability to like write a message and it'll go via email. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly a virtual trade show experience, but you know, it could also fill the gap. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time for uh, for industry to the tech industry to catch up and meet the sort of demand that that I think event planners are are, are creating right now. Awesome, thank you. So we're going to pivot now and we're going to open the floor up to those of you that submitted some questions. So I'm just going to see is Marie Jose from Concordia University on the line with us today. Yes, I am. Wonderful. So we have your question here. Did you want to pose it to the group? Well, actually, my question was, we're working with a lot of academics, people that are not familiar with uh, digital strategy. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, an example right now of an event that is postponed to, to next year, and we were looking eventually of going digital. So how can we, how can we convince those older generation to go digital and, and to reassure them that even in the academic world, it will be possible to, uh, to release, a, a, to give a Congress or to provide a Congress or a conference that will be interesting to everyone. That is a great question. And there's a, it's going to be a second parter. So I'm going to now open the floor to someone who had a similar question. Um, <laughs> Mikey Singer, are you with us? Mikey? No? Okay, Mikey wanted to know along the same vein as you, um, what new protocols are you looking at to make all stakeholders feel safe and encourage people to return to your events, whether that's another follow up via digital or you know, when you go back in person. So it's basically here we're talking about how are you reassuring or convincing stakeholders who might be a little apprehensive to take this step. And Bianca, I think I'd like to direct this question to you first because you are you know, the example of an association that did dabble in this realm. And I, get, I bet you had to try to convince a few people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think anytime we try something new and that definitely goes for something like this, a, a digital event or integrating a digital component into an event, there's absolutely a level of apprehension. And I think most of that or, or a big part of that, you know, certainly in our case came from, you know, what if it doesn't go as planned? What if it doesn't work? What if something goes wrong? You know, you're, you're stepping into uncharted territory. So there's risks and there's unknowns and you have to find ways to minimize those things so that everyone participating feels comfortable and confident 
apparent that um, you've done everything that you can to set up a platform and a um, environment for success, right? And so, you know, what we did um, in terms of, of creating that um, was really relying on some of the partners, the volunteers, the people in our association that had experience with this so that we had some proven successes to um, work with, you know, making sure we integrated those, you know, experts. Again, I mean, by no means do would I suggest that CAEM is an expert in this realm, but we had people in our um, you know, in our network that had experience and successes. So really bringing those people into the fold when you're going to do this, bringing your specialists, your experts, the people who have the knowledge and the confidence to help you pull this off and, you know, running through it. I mean, that was a big thing. We didn't just decide to do this and, you know, um, treat it the same way that we do other things that are, are proven and tested and you know that we know how to do well we took this as an experiment and we practiced we um trouble you know we did the troubleshooting we rehearsed we did dry run throughs you know all those things that you need to do when you try something new to make sure that it goes well um, and that everyone feels um, who's participating that they're going to come off, you know, looking great, looking successful and looking like what they agreed to participate in um, was well planned and well executed. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Raul, I'd like you to expand a little bit on this from the tech perspective. So what are you doing or other tech providers doing because of the fact that so many people, are, this is a new area for them um, and the tech might be intimidating. So let's just say they, they get beyond the idea phase and they're you know they're on board they're they're jumping in with two feet and they're really going ahead with it but how do you set your clients up for success um in terms of training resources um to make them feel confident with the decision that they've made to move to a digital platform yeah it's a good question so from a micro perspective you know there are the small concerns about like hey is everyone's audio going to be working is everything going to you know go well overall for this one individual event um, and like I said in, in the previous note, that there will be an expect, especially for larger events, some hiccups, some challenges, you know, everyone will make it through them. What the thing that we're really talking to uh, our clients and, and new people as well about is that this is an investment in a strategy for the future. So you shouldn't be afraid to take this risk now. Our organization, I'm sure many others, were intending on releasing virtual event platforms, whether near future or a year or two from now because i think there are too many signs that say people are you know using digital platforms more and more not saying that that's going to affect live events in any way but there's a lot of advantages and i'm sure we'll get to that from like a sales perspective and reaching a wider audience and sponsorship benefits and just creating more content and all these things are unlocked when you have a virtual event platform so the two things that we do are we make the business case for it you know, what is it going to do for your sales? How is it going to keep your show going on right now? Um, how are you going to be able to uh, encourage and promote your sponsors? How are you going to keep your members and your attendees engaged, even though you don't have that live event? But also that this is an incredibly important investment in the future. Even if things don't go exactly the way you want it for this upcoming event, your next event, which is going to be ideally a hybrid event, it's going to have some component of a virtual side to it as well. You're going to feel way more confident in that. Uh, is this, this is an opportunity to take a leap that a lot of events and a lot of organizations just wouldn't have taken. And that could have actually been uh, a much grave much more grave situation five, 10 years down the line when we start seeing events going virtual and we're now catching up or certain organizations are catching up to adopt, uh, adopt something that, uh, that, you know, other parts of the industry have already started using. So uh, it's all about for us, you know, looking a year ahead right now and using this opportunity to test the technology, test, make sure events are set up for success <laughs> for, for the future. Great, thank you. Finding the silver lining in COVID-19. Appreciate that perspective. <laughs> So now let's shift the focus, which you kind of helped with the perfect segue, is talking about the financial aspect of digital. So um, I, many organizations are not only grappling with um, digital events and what platforms and all of that, but as member-based um, and not-for-profit-based organizations, you know, the conference is usually the largest non-dues revenue source for these organizations. And so some, can, some people are, are anxious with the concerns around um, where is, uh, where is the revenue coming from now that their largest annual meeting may have to be canceled or postponed to a later date? So to help us um, start 
un unpacking this, I want to open the floor to Lori Pates. Are you on the line with us, Lori? Hi, Carly. Can you hear me? I can. Um, yeah, I, my question I think said was how do we how do we put a financial amount on this where we're not undervaluing or overpricing ourselves in a market, whether it's a hybrid or pure digital. Um, as Bianca said, um, actually I'm a colleague of Bianca's in the motorcycle show world. And I, I must admit, I have a hard time ever trying to picture a motorcycle show going pure digital only because it's so sensory driven. So that one I'm, I'm still struggling with. Um, we definitely use components to extend the life of our shows through the year to keep our um, riders and our consumers uh, engaged, but to go purely digital, that's a whole other com um, component. But from a CAM perspective, and obviously the co-chair of conference, and wanting to we're still a few months out, fingers crossed, who knows, right? You know, if we can have our conference face-to-face, -face, which is so important in our industry, we're all so face-to-face -face driven, that's who we are, um, but also extending it and having that digital component. But again, back to how do we value it? How do we put a value on that and keep uh, competitive in the marketplace? Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think that's a great question. I'm going to pass it over to Jennifer to share, you know, maybe some of the research that you were involved with and um, your advice on how to price um, to price these types of events. Yeah, great question. Um, great question. <clears throat> so one of the things I actually saw just to speak to Lori real quickly about taking a really experiential event digital. One group I actually saw this last week actually just ended on the 25th was Art Basel. Hong Kong, which is an art gallery show, um, and they had created an online viewing the experience before before everything happened um, with the cancellation of their show, but they pivoted and found a way to have the art galleries <laughs> online to experiment. So there are ways, especially if you're going to do a hybrid, that if you do need to pivot, you um, you can to still engage engage the audience. So now with with everything happen, happening with the coronavirus. It's looking at how do you connect your people and how do you recoup those expenses? And so there's lots of different ways to monetize. Um, there's ways, uh, and depending on your organization, depending on the actual event, uh, people can price things differently. So depending on, for example, if they need continuing education credit, um, you could potentially price that differently than if, if it's a mandatory meeting that you're inviting groups to come to. Um, it also is the value of what you're providing um, for them. So, um, you know, um, and, and why you're doing it, which is always the key to go back to the why. But at, at PCMA, when I was producing their event, we, were, we did not charge. Um, and, and partnerships and sponsorships is one way you can monetize. We were doing it, one, to allow people to experiment in the space, but two, also as a membership growth, um, you know, uh, engaging our audiences. And so from that to the report that, um, that Carly is talking about, we were getting a lot of positive feedback with our surveys and people that were coming uh, online. Um, they were very vocal telling us how valuable it was. But um, we created a report to actually see what the ROI back to the organization for the investment of what we had done. And we had actually sat down and um, mapped this out into a report with looking at people who had not attended one of our events face-to-face -face five years or more, um, and then watch what they did online. And we actually released this in a white paper um, out into the industry. It's still accessible if anybody wants to see it. Um, but what we did was we, we attracted over 4,000 people we had not engaged with before, in at least the last five years from a face-to-face -face component. And uh, for future registrations, for attended uh, membership, membership renewals, uh, future online um, programs, just over these from 2011 to 2016, brought in over a million dollars back to the organization, um, helped grow membership and helped grow face to face. And so, um, and so th when we were looking for the data out in the industry, there was nothing there. We decided to create it and look at our own. And then that's why we ended up putting out. We also looked at the return on engagement. Um, which not how did they, what money did they not necessarily spend, but how did they engage with us? Because that was a really important component that we wanted to um, 
wanted to focus in on. And we also saw a very powerful, um, a, a very powerful response to that. So over 400,000 uh, different touches happened, engagement points happened with the people that engaged with us. Um, so I think when you're looking at pricing, it's looking at from your organization, you know, how can you recoup your costs now and the value of what they're looking at um, and how they're going to engage and knowing that if you don't pay, it, you know, it could be a way to get partnership sponsorships um, and, and look at the long-term um, product, which, you know, I think right now is people are just trying to connect um, and find the way to connect because we can't connect physically. It's how do you recoup those costs? But then I think going forward, like Raul was saying too, I think this is going to become a strategic element, which then will help people grow their membership and engage members. And we've actually seen this happen before with hurricanes and snowstorms where people could not come but still stay engaged if, if there was a hybrid. Um, and I guess for pricing also, look, look at what else is out there. Um, things to think about, uh, have an introductory fee, um, provide discounts for people to come online. Look at how much CEU credit, if they were to buy it online through your online learning system, how much value are they getting from that? Um, and then you can, you can modify you know, as you go forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jen. That, there's a lot of great content there, which actually, you know, it touches a little bit on the next question. I wanted to see if Laurence Lavallee is on the line with us today. Hi, yes, I'm here. If you wanted to ask your question. Um, I think I maybe put two in there, so I'm not really sure which one. The one about my... revenue generation. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess it kind of goes into that conversation that we just had, but I guess I was wondering, since we're all in that situation that our events in person are our biggest, some of us are biggest uh, revenue generating for the association. So I'm wondering how can we price accordingly um, these online conferences. So we already do, at our association, we already do the live streaming, the hybrid events, and we charge minimal cost for that. So it's not really um, revenue generating so far. So I'm wondering what are other ways to really bring in that revenue, whether it's through partnerships instead or sponsorship instead of only um, like ticket sales. Mm -hmm. Great question. So I think um, moving away from how to price the events, let's, that was the, the previous question, but this one more about how can the live, uh, the digital event actually be a revenue generator. So, you know, Raul, I think that you have an interesting perspective because of some of the features that you and other tech providers have on your platforms. If you want to kick us off with the response to this one. For sure. Yeah. And uh, I think I'm going to sort of, um, you know, go off the same point that I had last time as well. I think we're all pretty confident that, you know, our live in-person events, they will be back. This is a short-term challenge that we all have to face. And, you know, there are going to be different ways we're going to weather the storm, whether it's by finding new ways to generate revenue from our virtual events or whether it's just going to be cutting costs or anything like that. We will all, we'll make it through and we'll come out on the other side. And I, I predict that live events will be even more, you know, uh, sought after. People are going to long for that connection that we're going to miss for the next little while. It's going to be good. But I think this is an opportunity to open up the, the potential for a lot more revenue from different sources for future events of ours as well. Uh, and when I say ours, I mean for the industry. Um, the thing that, you know, when our team kind of looked at the whole equation of like what makes an event, you know, we, we realized that there are a lot of self-imposed constraints on the whole concept of an event that are just baked into what it means to run an event. So what I mean is like you're constrained to a certain time in the year. You can only run that event at one time. And that means if you only generate revenue around that time for that one opportunity uh, space, you can only, you know, be in one certain location. So, you know, there are probably people around the world who would love to consume that content or attend it in some way, but they can't because they physically can't get there or the venue isn't large enough or whatever it might be. Quantity, you can only run, you know, a couple of events per year at most of that scale where you have large numbers of exhibitors, for example, or large numbers of session and then, uh, and then cost as well. I mean, there's a huge cost that's incurred when you're running an event in person. And a lot of these variables that were previously fixed um, are now free and you can do a lot with that concept. So when you're looking at events in the future, you can run more events, you can have a larger audience, you can, um, you have more permanence of your content that you can use to promote sponsors, not just at your single event at one point in space and time, but for the whole year and beyond. And what that opens up is the ability for 
you know, organizations that previously relied on you know, spikes in revenue because of big, around a certain event to now building, you know, a monthly kind of recurring revenue strategy for their organization where they have a revenue trickling in from other sources like selling their content and virtual passes or having year long sponsorships for their events. Um, and that's, very, very exciting. And the final point I'll make is those virtual attendees also become amazing leads because there's, of course, going to be an element of your live event that the virtual event is still not going to be able to capture probably for a long time. And they might use that opportunity to attend a lower cost version of your virtual event and realize, hey, I really want to be next year there in person. And they'll make that effort to be there. So we're very confident about, you know, how, how powerfully events, you know, live events are, of course, going to come back but that this is a strategy not to kind of bridge the gap right now from a revenue perspective, but what you can add on for your future events um, and, and future years to, to, to add to your revenue and not kind of think of it as a replacement. Mm -hmm. Carly, can I jump in maybe of with course. something? Because I think, you know, what both Jennifer and Raul just spoke to is absolutely what we experienced with um, our experiences integrating some digital into our events. Um, you know, as Jennifer mentioned first, sponsorship opportunities. We were successful at securing sponsorship for the live streaming that we did uh, because we had a group of members who, again, were our out-of-town members who, you know, traditionally wouldn't have been able to participate in a session like this unless they were willing to travel, who really were so excited to see the change and wanted to support and embrace that and, you know, make it something that was possible for themselves and, um, you know, other participants from across the country. So it was an opportunity for them to position themselves as innovators and supporting change and, you know, positioning their brands in a way that they wanted to. Um, and then as Raul said, it became an extension. I mean, I already talked about the value that it provided our, our members. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, that was the, the primary driving force. But we were able to charge not the same amount, obviously, as having been there in person. That was a decision we made that, you know, there was value, but we were going to price it because it was something brand new as well and not taking away or suggesting it was of lesser value. But, you know, to Jen's point, wanting to experiment and try something new, you know, that was the choice we made to offer it at, um, yes, a cost, but a lesser cost than the in-person version, but it became a revenue extension for us. So absolutely. I mean, the examples that they mentioned, we put into practice successfully. So it can be done. Awesome. Thank you. So we are going to move ahead. We're going to shift gears now, and I'm going to open the floor to Wilson Lamb. Are you on the line with us today? No? Well, Wilson Lamb from the Canadian Nuclear Society, he yeah, wants... Online. Oh, you are online. Did you want to ask your question to the group? Yeah, I'd like to know, um, I'm very new to this. Do um, you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, I'm very new to this uh, virtual uh, digital uh, roundtable. Uh, in fact, we are thinking of we belong to the Canadian Nuclear Society. In fact, because of um, the COVID-19, we the thing about our conference to be launched later on this year in November. So we are kind of planning, uh, if we do not launch it, we probably have a webinar as the interim solution to get people engaged and then maybe delay the conference in the future. But we'd like to explore the option where um, that could be hybrid situation where a uh, speaker and delegate may come and maybe people coming from the other countries, we have people from US, UK, as well as from Europe, may not be able to come and able to participate a virtual participation uh, in, in this kind of arrangement. Um, from a technology perspective, I want to know, uh, I heard that it probably be feasible, but we are, we are, we are a profit organization. And uh, we'd like to know with a potential audience of let's say from 600 to 800, would the technology available today able to do something like that with a uh, hybrid, uh, arrangement and from a cost perspective as well. So, so Wilson, uh, I can connect with you. There definitely are platforms that would meet those specific needs of the CNS in terms of the number of people, um, in terms of all the components um, that you mentioned and that I know about the event. Uh, but you did have a question specifically related to the parameters or the measures um, that would determine whether or not a digital event, once implemented, was deemed successful. So I wanted yeah. to focus on that because we kind yeah. of, you know, we started at the, at the beginning with what a digital event was. And we've kind of 
work through some of the, the components of that. And now just to tie everything together, um, you know, when we're hosting business events, there are objectives that are set forth. And at, at the end, you know, you know, measurement is everything. And you have to know if, it, if the return on investment or the return on engagement, like Jennifer mentioned, um, if it was there and if it was deemed a success. So um, if, if that's okay with you, we're going to focus on that question that you had posed. Absolutely. And, and I'd love Jennifer to, to dive deeper into the response for that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> great question. And um, so, uh, so with this, like Carly was saying, it goes back to your objectives, just like your face to face. So, um, you know, if you're trying to attract people from different areas or grow or keep engagement, um, I would look at, first of all, what those objectives are, and then how do you create those in a, um, in a, in a metric. So one example would be uh, number of attendees that you hope to get. So how many you might have on face to face, how many you want to engage with. Um, that's a great way to benchmark. So then as you continue to grow, you can see, you know, um, where they came from, where they your target audience, um, you can look at how many sessions they attended, um, what was their engagement. Um, and then also looking at the surveys and the, uh, uh, from all of my events that I've done with different groups, we always have different surveys that tie back to the, the why. So the value that you brought to them. Um, if it's, you know, for example, if it's, you want to get face to face, um, you know, does this make it more likely that they will come face to face in the next year? Because all this information is then important when you're looking and going back to your stakeholders on um, on you know how the actual event performed and then also looking at things like what their experience was and how you can improve that so one of the, the one of the greatest benefits of digital is being able to be nimble and hearing your audience um, and what they want and what they like and what they need more of um, so you know start small and focus in on the why and those objectives and then figure out how to tie back, but just a couple basics would be the attendance and then some of those metrics. The ROI and the ROE um, was something that we did over time, which was a lot more consuming to, to create, um, but that's really powerful to then your stakeholders to go back and see how see how you can grow it. Um, and you know, right now we have the, the, the virus that is locking everybody down, but by doing this, you then are able to attract people that um, you know, if it's industry press, if it's uh, the, uh, other events where people can't get visas to come to where you are because of a restriction with, with the government of wherever you're based, there's always going to be some kind of obstacle. Um, and so this will really give you a way to open it up to your audiences to, to support those objectives of your organization. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. I know we have a hard stop in about seven minutes, but there were some really great questions that came through on the chat box. Um, so I do want to open it up to our participants who are here with us today. Um, Brandon, Cyril, are you with us still? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Perfect. Um, a little bit earlier on, you asked me a question about uh, data security. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could share that with the group and, and see what kind of responses we can elicit. Yeah, for sure. I turn on my video, but uh, I'm using a tablet and it just no doesn't problem. have the juice. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, so over the last couple of weeks, I've been noticing I was an avid vi uh, Zoom user as well. And over the past couple of weeks, I've been noticing that they've been scrutinized for some of their uh, privacy uh, or terms and conditions around privacy and how they, I, th I believe, I don't know to what extreme this actually happened, but they... Uh, can actually record sessions that aren't being recorded and they're actually collecting data on sessions. And I'm just wondering um, what, what's, uh, I, I think that they've since changed their privacy issues, but what, what are the pan, what do the panelists think about that? And what are um, companies, tech companies like Feedloop, for example, doing to address these issues for clients that may have those concerns? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And we've had some questions from clients also um, that, that maybe work for the government or they work for educational institutions. So, you know, the data um, for everyone is, is a key concern uh, and consideration. So, Ro, I'll, I'll throw that one to you. What is Feedloop and other tech providers doing to ensure uh, data security during this time and, um, at, you know, in normal times? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I guess the question, you know, it, it's, it's, 
it's really, really broad. So it's hard to, you know, give a specific answer and say like, this is what we're doing. Uh, but, you know, I, and I can't speak too much about how other companies are managing security, but from our perspective, the, the least secure part oftentimes of an event um, is we find we find when if when an event runs, it's actually the on-site element. It's very easy whether you know people are handing out USB keys as giveaways that you could plug into your computer, or you know scanning your badge or scanning a badge that's just laying on a table without without permission or anything like that. Taking photos on site, things like that are very very hard to regulate in person, and and you know technology has limitations there. The great thing is uh, when it comes to the virtual space that we have a lot more control over the flow of data. We know exactly where data is going in and out of what system and attendees, exhibitors, sponsors, session providers, speakers, they all have the ability to, you know, if they want, just turn off their camera or turn off their audio or hide their profile or anything like that. They have a lot more control and ownership, uh, I feel, over their data. And that's pretty empowering. The thing that is something to think about that I've seen in general, not just for events, is that with more and more of these online tools being used as people work from home, and again, not just for events, uh, there are companies like Slack or Zoom or you know any of these companies that are powering that work from home experience, they are under threat because they're seeing a lot more traffic, they're seeing a lot more private data moving through people's personal devices and homes. Everyone's working from home on their own private networks, uh, personal Wi-Fi connections and all of that. And that's a serious concern for a lot of organizations. So there, I think it's only advantageous in general for the events to be virtual from a data security perspective. With that said, it's uh, important to be vigilant, of course. Thank you both. Uh, we are coming up on the hour here. Um, we do have a couple of other questions from the chat box. So if we don't, if we didn't answer it in the session today, then you can feel free to reach out to myself or any of the speakers. Their contact details are on the screen right now. And one of us would be happy to get back to you and help you uh, navigate the space. But to close our time out together today, I'd love to go back for final thoughts and a wrap up comment from each of our speakers. So Raul, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Harley. Um, you know, as a tech company, there's there there was a point a couple of weeks ago when it was very uh, upsetting. Uh, you know, we love being on site at events. Tech is obviously something we love, but being on site is is incredible, and we miss it dearly. But I, as we go further and further into this pandemic, I feel more and more that everyone is just longing greatly for that experience to be on site and they're going to value it a lot more as well. So I'm really, really excited and optimistic about what the on-site experience is going to look like. But with all of that, I think this period is going to be an accelerant for technology. We're going to see what might not have come out for five or 10 years now be out within a matter of months or weeks. We, we personally have spent the last month day and night building new tools to support this, which we would not have done for a long time. And uh, that's, that's very, very, you know, if there is a silver lining to it, I would say, at least from the tech side, it's that. And the thing I would say uh, to event planners is try your best, first of all, not to cancel your events, do anything you can to keep them online and don't settle for just reducing an amazing event to a webinar. You don't only have to rely on technology to, you know, to, to create that event experience. There's a lot of really creative ideas that I'm sure you get your teams together. You can, you can do all sorts of things. If it just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of creativity and technology can definitely help. I hope as an industry, we help each other out. Uh, I know, you know, we just recently switched to offering our virtual platform for free. I'm sure there's a lot of other, you know, initiatives like that going on to help us move through this, but I'm very optimistic about the future and I hope everyone else is. Thank you very much. Bianca, final thoughts from you, maybe how CAM is going to progress forward in this, in this time or, you know, just because with, with digital technology and the events, you know, beyond this point. Yeah, I mean, I was actually going to put on maybe my motorcycle show hat for a minute here. And, um, you know, we were in a really, really privileged position. Our six shows happened, you know, right before um, this crisis hit. And so I come at this from a position of, you know, privilege and, and luck and all of those things, but that's not something that I want to take for granted because a lot of companies are not in that position right now, whether it's in our industry or other industries where they're grappling with, you know, things like insolvency or their operations literally being, you know, halted and their activities being halted overnight. And so, you know, we're not in that position, you know, 
both from the motorcycle show standpoint and CAM standpoint, where, you know, I'm privileged to be able to be here and share ideas about how we can um, evolve and how we can be more resilient and how we can do things to um, address, you know, these crises when they come about and to, to make sure we stay relevant and we adapt and we engage. And so, you know, from my perspective, it's really, um, you know, let's not waste that opportunity that we have been given because not everybody has, you know, so let's take some risk. Let's try some things. I don't think anyone expects perfection in this environment. You know, Raul has already warned us um, ahead of time. It's not going to be perfect. We're going into uncharted territory here. So I don't think the expectation is perfection. It's adaptation. It's innovation. It's, you know, taking that bold step from that position of privilege and saying, you know, I am going to do something to take advantage of the position that I do have right now now and provide value to my members and, um, you know, do what I can to, like I say, adapt and be resilient and, and evolve and move forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Jennifer, what, what do you want to leave us with today? You know, <clears throat> I think this digital is a tremendous way to help pull us together um, during this moment of crisis. Um, obviously, people want to be connected and it's important for us to support our communities. It's a way to recoup the revenue that groups are desperately losing with the face-to-face. -face. And it's a way to diversify risk um, with doing hybrid events or going online for upcoming events that might be canceled. Long-term, it's gonna create tremendous opportunity. People feel comfortable in the space. Um, and it's gonna be a way to engage your audience, not just at that one face-to-face, -face, but year-round, like Raul said, and from all different parts of the country or different parts of the globe where they come from. Um, and, and like Bianca said, it's all about learning. It's um, from all of my experience in the last 10 years in this space, it's being nimble and learning and then learning from that moment. So just go in if you can, get help from, ask questions to any of us, um, Carly, get help um, to guide you on that. But just get started and know that everyone's in this together and um, it, it's a great, exciting opportunity that will bring us together and, and propel you in the future. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you, Raul Bianca, for joining us today and providing your insight and perspective on the topic of, of digital events. I think that uh, everyone who joined us today and those that will watch the rebroadcast a little bit later would agree that this discussion is just so robust. We could continue on um, for hours and hours and hours. What I'll leave you with is my team knows at Redstone that I've been pushing our clients to consider incorporating uh, digital into their live events um, as a contingency plan, as an added revenue source, as an added value to um, existing sponsors. Um, and, you know, member value, as Bianca mentioned, to being able to reach a wider audience. Maybe it's members, maybe it's prospects by rebroadcasting or live streaming. So, um, I'm a digital native and I like to think I'm tech savvy and I have encouraged our team at Redstone to be on the forward edge uh, and forward thinking in respect to these events. And so I'm, uh, you know, COVID-19, it, it's, it is terrible. Um, it, it's a time that we need to band together and get through it, but I am looking at the silver lining and I am very optimistic that this push towards digital or hybrid events will only make our industry, the event industry stronger and will really help uh, all associations modernize, um, differentiate and provide more value to all stakeholders. And I think that's really the key here. Um, so thank, thank you once again to the speakers. Thank you all for participating. I know we're a couple minutes past the hour, so I really appreciate you investing your time with us over the lunch hour. We will be hosting another webinar or two or three, depending on how long um, this crisis goes on for. And we'd love your input on topics that you're interested in, in talking about. So we have a poll live right now on our Instagram channel. So please go there and, um, and contribute your ideas. If you're not on Instagram, that's okay. You can use the chat box below or you can send me an email and we will be crowdsourcing that because we want to continue to provide value and bringing like-minded people together in a community setting such as this one. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Stay healthy and stay safe and we will be in touch soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Thank bye everyone. Bye, everyone.